It's time for Supply Chain Now. Broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain. The people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome back to the show. On today's episode, we're speaking with the CEO of one of the leading sustainability advisory firms in the world. This interview is part of our continuing collaboration with the Automotive Industry Action Group. So stay tuned as we look to increase your supply chain IQ. On a quick programming note before we get started, if you enjoy today's conversation, be sure to find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. Hey, I want to welcome in my fearless co-host on today's show, once again, Greg White, Serial Supply Chain Tech Entrepreneur and Trusted Advisor. Greg, good morning. Good morning. I love how you give me credit for fearlessness. So, thank you. <laughs> well, great to be back with you and great to continue really a series of hits with these yeah. uh, thought leaders that are plugged in, in in some way, shape, or form with AIAG, right? Yeah, I love, I, I love, first of all, I love the initiative, right? The uh, corporate responsibility initiative that AIAG is putting on and um, great hearing from all of these companies and how they are working to be better to, uh, as we said earlier today, right, to do well by doing good. Mm, absolutely. Great point. And you're referring to our supply chain buzz, which we live streamed earlier this morning. I um, want to welcome in, on that note, want to welcome in our featured guest here today, Ashton Carter, PhD, CEO at TDI Sustainability. Ashton, good morning. Good morning, c -Bass. Great. Thank you for taking time out during uh, a challenge, challenging set of circumstances and just a busy time in general. Great to have you here. Yeah, and great to be here. So uh, in typical fashion, we always like to kind of start our podcast conversations, getting a sense of, of our featured guests and, and their personal and professional journey. So Ashton, if you would, tell us, tell us a little bit about where you're from. Uh, and give us an anecdote or two about your professional journey leading to where you are now. Sure, thank you very much. Well, I'm I'm speaking to you from the from the UK, which is uh, where I was uh, born and started my work. But I also lived in uh, in the in the US for 12 years. Um, and you're right; it's a good question. Um, you know, when we were when I was at high school, um, creating or joining a sustainability firm wasn't really on the wasn't really on the, uh, the <laughs> list of professions you would choose so it is so it has been a bit of a journey um so i wouldn't say there's ever kind of like one moment you know one moment of awakening or realization that kind of drove in this direction but there's certainly been a um a couple of a couple of themes um throughout my career um the first is i i guess for a long while i you know, I've been alarmed, sometimes even shocked and driven to address the, you know, the social inequalities and the environmental issues that, that, we, that, that we all face and, and in some parts of the world are very obvious, you know, from the USA to Africa, from Europe to Asia. Um, and, you know, I became very kind of conscious about these things and began to question what we could do about it and driven to, and driven, driven to find, find solutions. But... I'm not really an activist. I never wanted to kind of take to the streets and mm -hmm. uh, and complain because, and I think the reason for that is because I never kind of saw it as one individual's the fool to one individual or one industry sector or government or an agency, but it's more of a systemic problem um, mm -hmm. that we've got to all address and we've got to address it um, collectively. So that was kind of one of the themes which um, kind of drove me to where I am. The, the second so on, theme is a hey, real quick second, question. On, yeah, on yeah. That, go ahead. On that note, it, it sounds like um, it's more about the movement. It's not about one individual action, but it's more about a movement to really drive more, to your point, uh, systemic change. Is that right? I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, we we've lived in we've lived in you know our parents' generation, my parents' generation. They lived in uh, in a world which is kind of binary, um, but more binary. It's very clear what was good and what was bad, and we hadn't begun to. They hadn't. The world hadn't begun to feel like it does now. The strains of a growing population and and resource use, um, and you know, essentially the success in the economy that 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 we've had. 
but now we're beginning to fill those um, strains but it's all part of a, a large system and you know supply chains are one of those systems mm. um, which are kind of um, uh, are, are immutably international they're not going to reverse so the question is like how do we enter into that system what can we do as we are all part of that system what can we do to kind of turn the different cogs and wheels to mm. Um, to, to shift it in the right direction and away from social inequality and environmental damage. And, and that's really when my second theme came in, I think, is, you know, because I've always been fascinated by business and I've always seen business as a, um, as a, creative, as a creative force. You know, it creates jobs, it creates technology, it creates solutions and um, creates, value for, creates value for society. When it goes wrong and companies behave badly, um, for sure, it can hold up progress to a bit, but generally, um, you know, the business business does, the business sector does find, entrepreneurs do find ways to um, serve society through their products and services. And you, you look around you nowadays and the, the te technology, the engineering, the innovative business models um, are all kind of quite astounding. So really, I guess why I'm here in the job that I do now is because I try to combine those two things. You know, how can you bring that creative force um, of business to um, be a part of um, changing the system so that we avoid and reduce these environmental and social in inequalities? And so it's, it's really this business is a force for good. Mm. Um, Love that. And I want to find that sweet spot. Love that. Created that uh, combining those two massive energies between uh, the creative force that is business and and doing good and, and, and doing good in a meaningful action oriented way. Um, real quick, before we dive deeper into your, one of your organizations, TDI Sustainability, you mentioned you lived for 12 years in the States. What part of the country? Mm -hmm. I was in Washington, DC, um, but traveled a lot around um, in Washington, DC. I was quite fortunate. I was working for a, um, a conservation group and also international development group in DC. And, um, we got to work with some of the biggest um, biggest U.S. companies. So you know, we'd, we worked with Ford Motor Company. We worked with, um, I helped Disney um, build their sustainability program with Marriott, um, United Airlines. Um, so it was, a, it, it, it was a great experience because, of course, the U.S. Is, is, is vast in its economic power. And when it turns its mind to doing something good, it, mm. um, it, it, it excels on the global stage. I appreciate you sharing that. We're going to have to bring you back for deeper dives into those those engagements with some of those iconic brands you mentioned. Um, yeah, no, so it, it does but, sound like this has been quite a journey for you. I mean, it, sort of a natural progression into TDI, I think. And, um, you, you know, this in its way has led you here. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing at, yeah, uh, absolutely. TDI yeah, um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I formed TDI Sustainability only about um, six years ago, and it, it was really because I noticed that um, there were, you know, a few firms who um, provided uh, expertise in sort of engineering, some who provide expertise on kind of risk management, some who did more kind of strategic um, um, engagements. Um, but none of them really kind of brought it all together underneath a sustainability banner. And, you know, we believe very strongly in TDI sustainability that to be a sustainable company, you know, it's as much about, it's all those different facets of the business. Of course, it's about how do you um, maintain a, a profitable um, business and a resilient brand, um, but how do you actually manage your risk? How do you um, capture value from marketing? Um, and, you know, how do you actually demonstrate you had a positive Im impact? So what we try to do is combine those different things under one roof. Um, so we have, um, you know, really kind of four different segments. We have TDI strategies, which is where we have our long-term engagements to advise companies on how to structure for sustainability and be recognized for what they're good, good at. Um, we also have TDI research where we do um, a deep dive into responsible sourcing and where materials come from. And that's one of the things I'll be speaking about at the upcoming conference. There's a publication we came out with uh, 18 months ago called Material Change, 
that maps and identifies the risk associated with 50 different um, 50 different materials supplied by auto um, brought by auto companies and electronic companies. And then we have TDI audit, which is really the um, the due diligence and risk management. And finally, the one which is really exciting for us is TDI impact. And we launched a um, an investment an impact investment vehicle, which is really a platform for downstream companies, auto companies, and electronics and jewelry companies. Um, to put their money, um, to put the money they have available under their grant budgets to good use upstream and invest directly into into mining communities and farming communities, um, so they can actually help those communities, which are right at the other end of their supply chain, build um, viable small businesses. So you pull that all together, and it's a way um, to connect this system, this this downstream with the upstream. And move it in the in a in the right direction towards you know business as a force for good um, across the whole value chain. So you're really helping these companies first of all know where they are in in terms of fair trade or um, you know or or ethical business practice get to where they want to be and then verify that they get or or sustain that. And then to fund further exercises in that regard, it sounds like you handle all aspects of that. Yeah, I mean, it, um, you know, a perfect engagement for us um, might start um, with a company which wants to understand its supply chain. Um, so, um, you know, some of our brands might have, you know, they could have, you know, 60 different supply chains and they might have, you know, 30 or 40 different materials and they don't know where all those materials come from, and they don't know whether those materials are associated with things that are going to present a risk to their brand from reputation or, um, <clears throat> or you know, some event that triggers a media response. Um, and these can range from all the different minerals and metals through to bioplastics, um, recycled plastics, uh, leather, rubber, um, the whole kind of gamut, really. And so we help them identify what are those materials and what are the respective risks between them and they need to know that so they can actually prioritize because you can't do everything on day one so how right. do we actually prioritize and then as you said to go and verify those practices and set up a strategy and verify those practices of those suppliers and then to prioritize you know if you want to actually make a difference how can you actually do that upstream so one example of that is um, um, the work we're doing with Cobalt in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And Cobalt, as you know, is um, one of the main ingredients for, for batteries, um, which are important for our future mobility. Right. Um, and there in the DRC is also, you know, if you read, if you Google DRC and Cobalt mining, you'll see that it's associated with, you know, child labor and um, human rights issues and environmental problems um, and the answer to, and the, the, the one of the challenges for um, companies is that you know you might have cobalt in your product um, but the chain it might pass through 40 different hands before it gets to you it goes from you know the small scale mine the artisanal mine through to a crude refiner exported to a refinery in um, in China, then to a parts manufacturer, and eventually kind of winds its way down. So your problem as a downstream company is how can you actually contribute to making a difference upstream when you don't have that direct line of, um, that direct line of connection? And so what we've done there, we've launched something called the Fair Cobalt Coalition, and we've, um, we have several companies in Europe um, and some coming on board in the U.S. and also in China, and we're getting together to, and, and also the government of the Netherlands as well, and getting together to create a, a fund so we can invest into those small-scale mines and help to eradicate child labor, build alternatives to dangerous mining, and improve the situation at, at the mine. Um, so wow. to me, that's really, that's really exciting because you, you, know, you can help companies um, understand their risk, manage their risk, but also turn that on its head and turn it into a virtue um, and provide a platform for companies actually to demonstrate that they're part of the solution, uh, not just, you know, part of the, not just part of the problem. 
Well, I think that that's, I mean, that's a big initiative. And I think that it's important for companies to resolve that. First of all, it's the right thing to do, which um, seems so unnecessary to say. But at, at, at times also, I think, as you said, companies are not necessarily aware of how their supply chain is sourced. But in this day and age with the empowered consumer, it's so much easier for the consumer to find out, put pressure on the brands that they buy, um, and, it, and it reflects on those brands as well. We've been talking about this quite a bit, Ashton, in, in terms of um, consumer awareness, and I think that that will help the initiatives that you all are, are undertaking. Have you seen anything in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, cons I mean, I guess I've been doing this for 25 years now, and if I go back to all the studies um, looking at consumer behavior, um, I was even reading one today, and they all say similar things, that when you interview consumers, um, they express a sentiment that they prefer to buy a product that they know is more ethical or has less environmental damage. Um, but when it actually comes to the, when it comes to the cash deal, they continue to buy the products that they know. Um, so it's difficult or to hit switch. Or their price targets. You know, we've seen or hit their price targets. Yeah. But that said, you know, if you, know, if you look just at the consumer, the consumer, you know, the opinion of the consumer is not only mediated through the cash tail, it also comes through the rise in civil society. Um, so from NGOs and rights groups, and they in turn um, put pressure on regulators. And so we have, I have seen in the last five, ten years, a real acceleration, um, an uptick in um, the pressure from different areas. Um, this year in particular in Europe, um, a little bit in the US, but in Europe in particular, is a big focus on the investment sector. Um, and the investment sector now in, the, in Europe have to report on their investments. And this is a whole new area where they're kind of ill-equipped at the moment to understand the different kind of um, sustainability issues in their investments. Um, and, yeah, and for sure, consumers are going to, you know, we're, I think especially now that we're going to see an acceleration of um, um, e-commerce and the ability yep. for consumers to comment and communicate um, through those platforms. Yep. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think it's uh, immutable, you know, it's a very sticky, um, it's, it's a, it's a sticky phenomenon that isn't going to go away. Mm. So it, it sounds like you've got a pretty, you've got a lot going on. I mean, with mm. the phases of your business that you have. So a lot of people have a certain perception of the CEO and their role in a company. Can you give us an idea of what your day to day looks like? <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> CEOs sort of do everything really, don't they? I, I guess the, I mean, Although I, you know, I manage our team of 20 or so people, um, really I haven't um, separated myself from the technical details. And, and I, I kind of think of my job as, you know, having a suit in the boardroom, but the kind of boots in the mud when you're going out to the field. So, you know, I, in normal circumstances, not just now, of course, I probably spend 50% spend of my time traveling quite often to places like the Congo and Kenya, Tanzania. Ukraine, um, you know, Georgia, um, South America, Colombia, Peru, um, to go out to these mines and these farms and these plantations where raw materials come from so I can understand for myself um, what, are, what the conditions are like and what can be done. Um, and then a lot of my time is spent, um, you know, talking with our clients. You know, you, it's really... It's really a dialogue, and it's uh, it's about listening. You, you have to understand as much as you possibly can. Um, what are the issues they're face, facing? What problems, both inside their organisations and out? Um, and then you know adapt our services to to serve them completely. So let's. Um, I want to broaden the conversation, Ashton, but I, I can't help but to go back to what you and Greg were talking about in terms of consumer sentiment. Um, you know, Greg and I discussed earlier this morning uh, some recent Accenture research that showed that 42% of consumers say that they would stop using a brand if they disagreed with its words 
or actions on a social issue. So, you know, we all learned about the importance of communications in our in our schooling, but gosh, picking the right stances and the right words which have a value uh, are arguably never more important than they are today. Yeah, I mean, um, you mentioned just before we went on air that um, one thing that you look for is uh, authentic communication. Um, so we were part of a, um, an exercise doing a survey of Generation Z in China um, a year ago um, for a luxury brand, trying to understand what those 16, 17, 18 year olds are, are thinking and how that affects things. Um, and a few trends came through there. Um, first of all, in China, you know, contrary to popular belief, um, people are very directly affected by what we kind of think of as corporate responsibility and sustainability. And that's because they face, you know, um, quite intense pollution in many of these cities. Um, and they can see it affecting their, affecting their health. And health is definitely um, um, something well, which is a rising trend. And, you know, COVID-19 is an example of how that's going to accelerate as well. Yeah. Um, but one thing they said is that, you know, one of the things which actually kind of got me really interested in what I do was uh, um, the inconvenient truth, which seems like a long time ago now. Do you remember the inconvenient truth? I do. Yeah. Um, they don't like the inconvenient truth. They don't like facts and figures. Um, so they don't respond anymore. And I think that's one thing that's changed is that the authority figure is no, is no longer has that same, um, that same trust in the public. In fact, um, last year, one of the surveys pointed out that people are much more likely to um, respond to, you know, thumbs up and thumbs down on social media than they are to a report with lots of figures and charts in it. What they do respond to is, is stories and words that um, resonate strongly with their set of values. And they really do follow um, icons of their generation um, who share those values as well. So I think to reach to reach the you know the upcoming generation who have a you know arguably a stronger interest in what happens in the next fifty years than some of us do, um, we need to you know really understand rather than fire them at, fire facts at them and figures and try and make the case from a logical perspective. We need much more to um, address it from a um, an emotional and uh, sensing perspective. Um, and make sure that we speak to them authentically in a genuine way because they'll, you know, sniff out the bullshit pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. I agreed. Agree. I love that. And, and, you know, Greg, we can't, we can't pass over when you asked about Ashton's role. I love this, and I'm a blatantly still it. Suit in the boardroom and boots in the mud when out in the field. I mean, that is yeah. – that paints such a great picture, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, it's, a, it's a broad – base role, right? And in an organization your size, I mean, really any size, it's very appropriate. Yep. Agreed. <laughs> All right. So Ashton, as promised, let's broaden the discussion out. You're, you've already, in just a few minutes time, been speaking at a lot of, uh, speaking to very intelligently on a lot of trends that are impacting not just global supply chain, but global business. Um, so what else, when, when, you, when you think of the, the trends and developments that are shaping and innovation shaping global supply chain today, what else comes to mind that you're tracking more than others? Well, the one that comes to front of mind at the moment and, you know, sticking with um, mineral and metals um, material supply chains is the relationship, this relationship between this circular economy um, movement and its implication for the sources of the materials that we that we need to build automobiles and electronics and and we use a lot in construction um, so you know the critical minerals like kind of manganese and copper cobalt and lithium molybdenum zinc um, and even lead um, which is still used a lot in a lot in batteries you know the hope is that the circular economy this new way of thinking or revised way of thinking is going to somehow reduce the need for these materials. But we've been doing some work recently with the World Economic Forum and looking at these trends. And 
we can see that the even with the potential of some of these circular economy um, initiatives, which is really kind of looking mostly at recycling, the, the, the demand gap for these critical materials is going to only grow over the next 10 or 15 years. Um, and so, you know, the hope that just recycling more, which of course is a good thing to do, um, is going to reduce the need for raw materials um, isn't totally true or not evident yet. Um, and so really companies are going to have to look at two things. They're going to have to look at, um, yes, how do we um, get involved in the search for economy, um, but also where these raw materials are going to come from that we need. And although for sure with um, coronavirus, supply chains are going to shift, especially apparel and food supply chains. Um, you know, minerals can't just be moved around the world. They're mined where they're found. Um, and so we're going to have to figure out how we're going to have those materials on the market in places such as with the DRC and um, Ukraine and other places, um, which sometimes are a little bit scary for downstream companies. And we're going to figure out how to how to get them out. Mm. Also, we're going to have to uh, look to see uh, and begin to make a judgment about where we want to go to places we haven't thought of before. So another project we're working on is looking at deep sea mining. So this is looking um, deep under the ocean to the ocean floor to extract cobalt and manganese and copper um, to areas, parts of the world that no one has ever been to, um, at depths where it's so dark you can't even see. Um, and we have to make a judgment whether that is better than getting it from, you know, a, an area which is known for, which is known for conflict. So those are interesting things. And finally, I think it's what is that going to all that together? Is that going to mean for some of the traditional industries like mining, which are used to digging a hole in the ground and recovering minerals and sending it to market? And I think one thing we're beginning to see now is that the business model might change and change. And um, instead of being mining companies, they um, and own assets around the world, they might become um, mining service providers. Um, and their job would be to seek how to extract different minerals for different um, applications from different sources that haven't traditionally been um, seen. So I think over the next 10 years, we're going to see emergence of these sort of questions coming up. And of course, um, auto companies and downstream industries are going to have to be part of that conversation um, and think of what are the implications of their business and what's this mean for responsible sourcing? You know, um so if I can pose this question to you, and this, this, we didn't get a chance to talk about this pre-show, but, but I really, um, one of the things that we've, we have spoken a lot about on any conversation that touches on sustainability and certainly the bigger picture circular economy is, and Greg, we were just talking about that this morning, you and I, uh, we were mm -hmm. talking about how we've got to push circularity thinking upstream. Uh, and, and get it baked more effectively into um, companies' strategy, and, and so that we can really make as much progress as possible. I, I'm not, I, I can't put that as elegantly as it needs to be stated, but Ashton, I want you to get weigh in on that, if you would. What, instead of being in reactive mode, what, what are some of the ways that you're seeing companies really move this thinking in the, in the discussions and the planning upstream so that we can get more done? And by upstream, you mean upstream in the supply chain, like up a mine, or yeah. you mean yeah that? And in terms of uh, upstream, maybe in a different way, meaning um, you know planning for it up front, planning for it in product design, instead of trying mm -hmm. to figure out what to do with products after they've been made, you know, baking in CE thinking in terms of manufacturability and product design. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. To me, I mean, recycling is um, really a matter of infrastructure, and we just need to have um, infrastructure built to, to recover. So in some ways, although that's necessary, and it's surprising how some supply chains still have a long, long way to go to those consumer waste, um, at least that's a trend which is understood. But to me, yeah, the most exciting one is, just as you say, is the, is the design. So it's designing for the circular economy and how are we going to do that? Um, you know, how do you make disassembling equipment easier so it's easier to recycle? You know, how can you make things more durable? 
you know, we have one client, um, a small client, um, but very innovative called Fairphone um, in the Netherlands. Um, and Fairphone, um, although, is getting, although it also gets um, you know, fair trade gold into its product, it also has a modular phone. So this phone you know, can be taken apart into like six to eight different pieces, <laughs> and it's designed like that from the outset. So they only have, I think they're now on Fairphone 3, and they've been around for, you know, 10 or 12 years, <laughs> where, other, where other kind of um, phone companies, cell phone companies would, you know, change their devices every 18 months. So they've been really thinking very hard about, right from the outset, how do you design the product um, so it's more durable, but also retains its attractiveness to the consumer um, and, of, and of the cost that is expected in the market. You know, and some European car manufacturers have also done that. They design cars um, with the decommissioning in mind. So how can a car be, you know, totally dismantled without any of it going to landfill? Mm -hmm. um, so all those sort of things, I think, is going to be the cutting edge if we can, you know, release some, um, uh, we can release some resources to push at that innovation curve. So I wonder. This, this could be a really, um, really deep conversation, Ashton, so let me know if it, this is a deep or a dumb question, but, um, you know, the, the attributes for which we mine cobalt and manganese and some of these other items, I wonder if there are companies exploring how to get the same attributes or capabilities without those products. Is anyone doing that yet? But yeah, substitution. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in the in the material change report that I mentioned earlier, um, and that I've, I've been asked to comment on at the conference, that substitutability was one of the um, was one of the parameters that we looked at for different products. Um, so the answer is that you know some people are looking at that. Um, it's a matter of economics um, and as how always. you can have, as always. Uh, yeah. But there are some things which are just, um, you know, very difficult to replace, such as zinc, for example. Yeah. So zinc, zinc is a specialist metal. It's associated a lot with kind of steel and specialist applications for steel. And, you know, although many of these industry institutions and auto companies and electronic companies look at alternatives, they can't, they can't always find them. So I think there will be um, some substitutes. Um, also, I think you're talking about the consumer, and I think this is the, the complexity of the consumer. Yes, as we kind of mentioned earlier, they want to buy products which are seen to be more sustainable or less harmful, um, but they also have a quality standard as well. So yeah. here's, here, here's one example. It's like, you know, it's perfectly possible now to, um, to manufacture leather um, artificially. Um, or from recycled scraps of leather, um, and to make that feel like leather and smell like leather, um, it is in effect leather. Um, but if you speak to the luxury auto companies, again, there's no way that we can sell a car at the price point you want to sell a car if we don't <laughs> put real genuine hide into that automobile, um, because our customers won't expect, accept it. So mm. there's a so there's a there's a bit of a you know. <laughs> there's got to be education, you know, there's got to be education yeah. or there's got to be some trigger that says, you know, <laughs> perhaps it's okay to have a different type of quality of that from that which I'm used to. Um, and it can still be just as enjoyable, but also place less pressure on, you know, planet and, um, and, pe and people. Yeah. Interesting. Well, you, you mentioned earlier that you're, uh, you are giving another talk, right, at the at the conference or at the summit. So, yeah. uh, you know, it makes me think, I wonder what, um, you know, we've talked, we've talked to a lot of people who are, who are attending or contributing to this summit. And I'm curious what value you see or you get, or you recommend to people from, uh, AI AG. Yeah, I mean, in the end of the day, TDI Sustainability is a problem-solving agency. You know, um, the, the value we create, hopefully, is through um, you know, anticipating, understanding, responding, creating 
um, solution to the problems that businesses face so they can you know, hope to advance on a journey to um, having a positive Im impact. So the, this, this, this conference really gives us an opportunity to listen, and I mean really listen, to what it is that our, our clients and prospective clients, um, what problems they're facing. And also to you know, brainstorm a little bit, go back and forth on some of the ideas that we've been having for how we can you know, push this forward, push this mission, this, this, this agenda forward um, in a way that allows for the you know, increase, the, the, the continued profitability of those um, companies while demonstrating how they're uh, you know, bringing value to society. Sure. Mm. Uh, we're, we're certainly big fans. We, we've enjoyed collaborating with, with uh, Jim and Tanya and the AIAG team in a number of different ways over the last, uh, I don't know, going back probably to summer 2019 and looking forward to uh, all the programming as part of the CSR Summit uh, coming up really soon here. So um, Ashton, uh, we want to make sure, I'm, uh, I am positive that we're going to have folks in our audience and our listenership that want to reach out and compare notes with you and learn more about TDI. Uh, TDI sustainability. Um, how can folks reach out to you and how can folks also learn more about your firm? That's great. Yeah. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, well, probably the best way is through uh, my LinkedIn and that's um, Ashton Carter is my LinkedIn name. Um, spelt in a rather unorthodox way. So that's A-S-S-H-E-T-O-N Carter. Um, or straight to our website, the URL of which is tdistrategies.com. Perfect. Perfect. That's simple. Yep. Um, we'll really have enjoyed it. It's, it's tough to uh, do justice to these really big picture, meaningful ideas in, in less than an hour. But we'll have to reconnect with you again soon here, Ashton. Really appreciate your thought leadership expertise and your passion around not just sustainability, but, but really um, social responsibility that is so yeah. fortunately so um, it seems to be more prevalent now than than in years past, and that's that's a good thing. Uh, Greg, your take? I'm I'm glad we're having this discussion. You know, we talk a lot about sustainability. One of the things we need to talk about more is eth ethicality in supply chain, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. um, and I think it, you know the there's no there's no reason to continue to sustain these old methods and, and some of these so ridiculous child labor and sla even slavery and things like that and um, you know that's virtually unfathomable and frankly um, unknown by so many people in the world which is about the only reason that it exists and I see I see companies and advocates as you mentioned before Ashton I, I see advocates and activists starting to go more directly to the people rather than even to the government agencies uh, to drive this kind of change and I think that's a that's a really good thing to see, and that will probably accelerate change. Great point there, Greg. Well, uh, thanks again, Ashton Carter, PhD, CEO at TDI Sustainability. Really appreciate your time and look forward to reconnecting with you at the event. Thank you very much, and I'm very much looking forward to it. All right. Great. So to our Thank listeners, uh, be sure to – I didn't mean to cut you off there, Greg. <laughs> I know you, you had a comment. Okay, just a thank you. <laughs> Easy enough. Um, to our listeners, be sure to check out a wide variety of industry thought leadership at supplychainradio.com. Find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. On behalf of the entire team here, Greg White, Scott Luton, Amanda, Clay, Kelly, Michelle, you name it, we wish you a successful week ahead. Stay safe. Don't panic. Please, though, follow the expert advice and precautions that have been distributed and know this, that brighter days lie ahead. So we're going to see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.